Good morning and welcome to the Vermont House Human Services Committee. Today is Tuesday, March 22nd. And for um, a brief time this morning for about the next, uh, we are um, lucky to, uh, we're going to be focusing on uh, H 728 and act relating to opioid response services. And in particular, we're looking at uh, pre-authorization and um, as well as any other um, barriers to access to medication for opioid disorder. And we're very fortunate to have with us um, Dr. Um, Luconis. Dr. Luconis, please begin. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, Dr. Laconis from Gifford Healthcare. I'm an addiction medicine specialist, and I understand that you've asked me to speak a little bit this morning about prior authorization requirements for buprenorphine containing products for the treatment of opioid use disorder. Um, I wanted to start out by noting that, you know, yes, indeed, we are in the midst of a opioid uh, overdose, overdose epidemic in Vermont and throughout the United States. A uh, big contributor is synthetic opioids like fentanyl. And I think it's great that people are trying to think about uh, new ways that we might be able to help our patients get access to safe treatment with FDA approved medications. However, I'm a little bit concerned um, about simply eliminating prior authorizations for some buprenorphine containing products uh, to step back. I think it's important that we remember that buprenorphine itself is an opioid, which can cause euphoria and can be habit forming leading to addiction. So it's important that we make sure that supplies of buprenorphine most safely get into the hands of people who need treatment and not into the hands of people who may use it recreationally to develop, to develop their own new problem. Um, to step back, once again, I think we need to look at balancing harm reduction, such as decreasing opioid overdoses with public safety. One of the things that has been built into buprenorphine products um, is the addition of a medication called naloxone. So this is a combination product, and that is meant to help decrease the risk of people injecting uh, buprenorphine products. Um, should they inject a combination product, um, which can increase euphoria and the possibility of addiction, um, it can, will cause withdrawal because naloxone is something more commonly called Narcan. Um, so I think one of the things they're looking for in eliminating the prior authorization is getting rid of uh, or making accessible products that don't contain naloxone. Uh, I think that this is a safety mechanism that's built into the medication uh, that should be left that way. Um, that being said, there do seem to be a certain proportion of people who don't tolerate the naloxone that's in the combination product. They may absorb a small amount to their body and it may cause side effects. So I think we should have a mechanism within our prior authorizations to make it easier um, for providers who have demonstrated that a patient is not tolerating a combination product to have them be eligible to receive the buprenorphine model product. Uh, before I go on, are there any questions on pharmacology that I'm just describing? Uh, I don't think so, um, but I'm wondering, uh, sir, if you could, um, are you a, uh, are you solely a, um, a spoke provider or do you also utilize, um, have patients who utilize private insurance? So I am a spoke provider, but I have a combination of uh, private insurance, self-pay, and Medicaid. Okay. And all, all as it relates to um, 
uh, opioid addiction? Or is the only patients are that you are seeing those um, through Medicaid? No, so I see um, patients who have private insurance on our self-pay, both for buprenorphine treatment and uh, naltrexone or Vivitrol treatment. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lutonis. Um, just a couple questions for you. Yes. One is, uh, have you prescribed the monobuprenorphine product for your patients experiencing um, or, or needing medical assisted treatment? I have on occasion uh, needed to use the, the mono product. Um, and these are folks, patients who um, reported an intolerance to combination product. Generally, I start with the, the film, the combination of buprenorphine and naloxone. If that's not tolerated, say, for instance, due to nausea and vomiting, uh, for example, um, then I will switch to the combination tablet product because that also has less risk of misuse and diversion. Um, if that's not tolerated, then I would move on to the mono product. Wonderful, thank you. And um, when prescribing the, the monobuprenorphine product, do you see a difference in the process between uh, those who are on Medicaid versus those who are on private insurance? Uh, private insurance generally has more flexibility in what I prescribe, as long as I don't uh, exceed certain prescribing dosage limits, like uh, standard 16 milligrams. So in other words, the private insurance doesn't have a, a prior authorization in place for a, a monobuprenorphine product. It varies amongst prescribers, but it's not as consistent as it is with Medicaid. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, Dr. Luconis, thank you for being here this morning. Um, I'm just uh, curious as to what's been your experience with diversion? your patients and diversion? So I regularly talk with my patients about diversion, you know, what they have seen, particularly when they're coming into treatment. Um, it seems like the buprenorphine mono product is the preferred diverted medication. Um, it's much more often used intravenously, uh, which can lead to a lot of bad medical outcomes beyond the risk of overdose, you know, such as heart infections, um, bone infections. Um, we have uh, mechanisms in place where we try to detect diversion, such as by looking at uh, levels of buprenorphine and its main metabolite, norbuprenorphine in people's urine samples. Uh, we do medication callbacks where we randomly call people to have them come in and count their medications. Um, one of the nice things about the uh, Suboxone films is they also have serial numbers um, on each package, which are unique so that we can have a pharmacy photocopy those serial numbers provide them for us and do a medication callback to make sure that a patient hasn't simply borrowed medication from someone else in order to make up a difference in their count. Whereas with the monoproduct tablets, there's no mechanism like that for trying to track for diversion. Um, I think, you know, some make the argument that um, if patients want to divert, they're going to find a way to divert. And, and I think that's true, um, you know, if that is their intention. However, um, I think if you put some kind of mechanisms in place to help prevent that, you definitely do prevent the rate of diversion. Have you, um, I guess one of the things I'm trying to get at is I'm just wondering if, if you were to estimate what percentage of your patients you believe have uh, have diverted their medication. I'm um, trying to get a, a handle about how big of an issue it is. Well, it's hard for me to estimate, but I'll, I'll tell you now that many patients or most new patients I have coming in are positive for buprenorphine and they haven't been prescribed it. So there's mm -hmm. definitely a substantial supply on the street. And 
Um, you know, I agree with harm reduction. It's wonderful for patients who have an opioid use disorder to be finding a safe way to manage their illness, even if it is on their own without the, the best follow-up. Um, however, I do worry about sort of that being diverted into recreational avenues so that we're developing a new, um, a new generation of people with opioid use disorders who have initiated with buprenorphine. Okay, thank you. Well, Representative Wood, you uh, spurred a, a question for me, which is um, thinking about knowing that there is, is buprenorphine on the street and that you're experiencing folks who have gotten a supply from the street and are now connecting to healthcare. I'm sure there's some correlation between barriers to access um, in that. But wondering how often do we see um, looking at the crisis of opioid and overdose deaths in the state, um, how often do we see buprenorphine in people's systems when they are dying of overdose? Uh, relatively infrequently. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, fairly, that's fairly uncommon. Uh, I'm, but that's not really the reason why I'm concerned about diversion, you know, I'm more, uh, the risk of overdose from diversion is, is lower and it, it will likely be higher if we don't have combination products prescribed um, because of the increased risk of overdose. But I'm more worried about simply putting lots of buprenorphine on the street because I, I think there's a misconception out there that it's not somehow not addictive and not harmful. And we're going to be creating people with a new addiction and I have seen that more and more over the years that people come in where buprenorphine was the first opioid that they had used recreationally that led to a full-blown opioid use disorder. Um, uh, uh, doctor, thank you. And um, I wanna echo uh, the comments of the vice chair. Thank you for coming in. Uh, I, am, I am curious, you um, have expressed a um, support for the need for pre-authorization. And I wanna say, you know, perhaps as it narrow it, I'm gonna narrow it as it pertains to the mono um, drug. And the pre-authorization for the most part is only for, Medi for Medicaid. And you serve other um, patients who have, for instance, Blue Cross Blue Shield, mm -hmm. who do not have the same pre-authorization. So I'm wondering how you um, balance that and what is the difference um, in terms of your concerns related to patients with med uh, receiving um, their health care insurance through Medicaid as mm -hmm. opposed to, um, for instance, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Well, I'm focusing on the, the patients who I most commonly see. Most of my patients are Medicaid patients. Uh, the Blue Cross Blue Shield are, are relatively um, infrequent. Um, and I, I use my own parameters of starting out with uh, the least attractive product for diversion, which would be the Suboxone films, um, even when I'm seeing somebody with uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance that's where I start. So I use kind of the same um, protocol that Medicaid currently uses in, in stratifying um, the manner in which it will approve reimbursement. So we have asked you lots of questions and I wanna uh, make sure that you have, um, if you have other, I think we've interrupted your presentation. So I'd love for you to <laughs> continue. Not, not at all. I was just prattling on. So, um, yeah, um, I mean, the other things that I, I want to um, uh, bring up is that, you know, there's been some who might argue that in the age of fentanyl, um, inductions might be easier with the mono product versus the combination product. And actually, when we look at the data, there is no data that supports that contention. Um, we know that uh, in the age of fentanyl induction with any buprenorphine product is, is quite difficult and we need to understand more about it. Um, 
even when you look at uh, you look back uh, at the initial prescribing recommendations for Suboxone back when it was manufactured by uh, Reckitt Benckiser, you know, they made it very clear in terms of dosage limits that, you know, once you reach 16 milligrams for um, an individual patient with a combination product, you should be thinking very carefully about whether you need to go higher than that dosage. Um, because it may indicate that it's not an effective medication. There may be a better treatment for the patient, such as methadone treatment in a hub. Uh, and actually verbatim from the most recent Suboxone package insert says dosages higher than 24 milligrams daily have not been demonstrated to provide a clinical advantage. So I would think, you know, uh, at least, you know, any pursuit of elimination of a prior authorization for above 24 milligrams a day of combination product would probably not uh, be a good clinical recommendation in my opinion. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for, for <clears throat> excuse me, taking the time out of your uh, schedule to uh, uh, educate us and to share a different perspective than what we have heard. Um, and I think that's um, helpful to us. Thank you for the Thank opportunity. You. All right, bye-bye. Thanks, bye-bye. Um, <clears throat> good morning, Dr. Lord. Uh, you, you are muted, sir. Thank you, yes, good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Vermont House Human Services Committee. Um, and thank you for being here um, to talk about uh, whether it, you know pre-authorization and you know removing barriers uh, to uh, access to medication-assisted treatment. Um, thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. And please go ahead. I don't know if you have um, prepared remarks that you want to start with. Sure. Um... Well, thank you. Uh, I have been doing this for about 15 years now uh, after my fellowship at the University of Florida in addiction medicine. And there are a couple of things, a number of things that uh, I would like to talk about after reading the bill. Um, buprenorphine naloxone up to 24 milligrams as Dr. Laconis just pointed out, uh, has not been demonstrated in the literature to have any positive clinical effect. And in in fact, early on in my experience, people requiring more than that were in general diverting their medication. They didn't need it and they were taking the extra medication and selling it. And that's just, that was just a fact that I was able to demonstrate. Um, I have a number of patients on up to 24, not a number, but I have several patients up to 24 milligrams um, for reasons that I'm not sure, but it's an individual thing. And I agree that, um, you know, uh, prior authorization of buprenorphine naloxone up to 24 milligrams for somebody who is treating someone with an opioid use disorder is an unnecessary barrier. Buprenorphine monoproduct, on the other hand, I would support a relaxing of the, um, of the, uh, prior authorization requirements because I, there are a number of patients who have distressing side effects as a result of the combination product. And currently, uh, I have to practically get an act of Congress in order to get buprenorphine monoproduct approved for these patients. Um, they require, uh, among other things, uh, uh, various means to treat the, uh, and to mitigate the side effects. Uh, this is medically silly. Uh, we're not developing, we're not giving cancer chemotherapy here, which, uh, you know, that makes some sense to treat side effects. Uh, but if you have a drug that's producing side effects and you can treat that with another drug that does the same thing, that makes sense to me. That said, as Dr. Luconis points out, buprenorphine monoproduct is still the preferred formulation for diversion. It can still produce euphoria when injected. Um, 
the street price of a buprenorphine tablet on the illicit market, at least in this area, is anywhere from $30 to $50 for an eight milligram tablet as opposed to 10 to 15, maybe $20 for a, a buprenorphine combination product. And there are also pharmacies that demand justification for buprenorphine monoproduct to the point where I've had one pharmacy actually demand treatment notes, um, which fortunately the Board of Pharmacy stepped on uh, as being completely inappropriate. Um, but they are afraid uh, that they need to do due diligence in case the DEA comes nosing around and wonders why they are dispensing uh, buprenorphine monoproduct because the idea of diversion is quite, uh, is quite on their mind. I would support the relax relaxation of uh, the prior authorization for buprenorphine monoproduct up to 16 milligrams with the attestation of the of the prescriber that there are unacceptable side effects of the, um, the, the buprenorphine combination product uh, up to 16 milligrams. Beyond that, uh, again, we would worry about excess medication on the street and diversion. And I think a prior authorization above 16 milligrams is not inappropriate as long as the barriers are not onerous. Um, I would like to emphasize what Dr. Luconis talked about is the idea of precipitated withdrawal, particularly with any drug, not just fentanyl. You've heard testimony that the buprenorphine monoproduct, the buprenorphine combination product is the naloxone that causes the problem. It's not. It's the buprenorphine that competes with the receptor pushes the fentanyl or the heroin or whatever off the receptor and causes the precipitated withdrawal. The naloxone is scantily absorbed and has physiologically no effect whatsoever. So the notion that you can induce somebody uh, on easier on buprenorphine monoproduct than you can on the combination uh, is simply a gross misunderstanding of the pharmacology of the drug. Um, and that, that comes directly from the eight hour uh, um, certification course that SAMHSA puts on that I have taught um, in the past. Um, however, fentanyl does cause problems with induction. And the reason is because the drug is very highly lipid soluble. It sits in the fat stores and takes a long time to leach out. If we wanted to do something wonderful to help treat this, uh, requiring insurance companies to pay for a period of medically managed or medically monitored um, uh, detoxification in a supervised setting like an inpatient setting would be wonderful um, because it is very difficult to induce somebody off of a full agonist drug like fentanyl or heroin uh, on an outpatient basis with buprenorphine because of this competition and the precipitated withdrawal. Um, a couple of other points. I've had four cases of um, bone infection in the uh, vertebral body in the back uh, as a result of infection of buprenorphine monoproduct in the past 12 years. Um, the MedWatch form that you've heard uh, is such an onerous um, requirement. We haven't had to fill that out since October of 2020. So if someone's still filling it out, I wonder why. And as far as a waiting list is concerned, I am unaware of a waiting list uh, to access medication assisted treatment in the state of Vermont with the exception of one program where they're having terrible uh, staffing problems. If you call my office this, this morning to get an appointment for medication assisted treatment, we will see you tomorrow. And that is also true in the opiate treatment program that I'm the medical director of in West, Le in West Lebanon. So I I'm unaware of, of barriers. More to the point, barriers to treatment are things like transportation, under or uninsured individuals, uh, people with difficulty with childcare, um, that kind of thing, uh, which are all things that we're working on to try to mitigate through grant programs and, and other things. Um, not to say that this isn't a difficult problem, but we have a lot of good people in Vermont that are working on this problem. Uh, and, and I think you should be aware of that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Lord. Um, before we take questions, um, I'm not sure everyone around the table, or for that matter, people who are listening on YouTube, um, 
know your background and know where in fact you are a, um, a, a doctor and whether or not you're participating in the, as a spoke. And so if you could talk a little bit about that. Certainly. Um, I, uh, my, my specialty is addiction medicine. I'm certified by the American Board of Preventive Medicine in addiction medicine and also the American Board of, of Addiction Medicine. Um, my fellowship was at the University of Florida in, uh, in Gainesville under Dr. Mark Gold and Dr. Ken Thompson. Uh, I've been practicing in Windsor for approximately the last 15 years. I'm currently the medical director and chief executive officer of Connecticut Valley Addiction Recovery, uh, it, which is a um, addiction practice in Windsor, Vermont. We primarily provide medication assisted treatment to almost 300 patients uh, for opiate use disorder, as well as alcohol use disorder and other substance use disorders. I'm the medical director at uh, the Comprehensive Treatment Program, uh, Habit Opco in West Lebanon, which is an opioid treatment program providing methadone and a hub program for uh, the Department of Health Access um, with buprenorphine, um, which I have been for approximately the last five years. Before that, I was at uh, uh, Methadone Clinic in Southern New Hampshire. I'm currently an assistant professor of psychiatry and addiction at the Geisel School of Medicine. Uh, and uh, we treat, uh, we teach um, um, PA patients at Franklin Pierce University and the addiction psych fellows from Dartmouth. Uh, and I'm the president elect of the Northern New England Society of Addiction Medicine. Thank you, thank you. That's very, very helpful. Um, uh, and Dr. Lord, um, we have a question. Yes. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lord. Uh, just wanted to make sure I understood that you would say that the preferred, or not necessarily preferred, but there's really nothing wrong with the, uh, the combination medicine versus the buna norphine. I thought I was hearing that that was the non preferred uh, drug, was the combination of those two together. It sounded to me like you said that you would think that uh, it's as good, if not better, than the buprenorphine, but maybe I misunderstood that. The buprenorphine combination product is the preferred way, is the preferred drug that we use to start because of its low, uh, uh, its low uh, abuse potential and the fact that it has been extensively studied. It works just fine for most people. There are some people who have unacceptable side effects for a variety of reasons. Either the naloxone causes uh, uh, unacceptable side effects, uh, the dye that is uh, present in, in some of the combination products uh, causes uh, problems, the filler products, the film themselves. I've had people with uh, develop ulcerations uh, under the tongue and in the oral mucosa because of, uh, because of the films. And for that reason, the having the buprenorphine monoproduct as an alternative is certainly a reasonable, uh, a reasonable thing. And I think that significant barriers to its use uh, are not helpful. That said, the buprenorphine monoproduct, again, is the preferred formulation for people who choose to abuse the drug because the, the reason the naloxone is in the combination product is to cause problems if somebody tries to inject it. It is not absorbed well under the tongue or orally, but it is quite well absorbed if you inject it and it will cause problems. It will cause people to have uh, some degree of withdrawal. That doesn't stop people from doing it, but they would rather inject the monoproduct because it's not there, because the naloxone is not there. And that's why I tend to be extremely careful with uh, with who I prescribe monoproduct for, because I, you know, as I said, I've had people run into problems uh, and develop significant complications from injecting anything. And I, you know, so I want to avoid that if at all possible. Thank you, uh, thank you Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Dr. Lord, for uh, being here today and offering your perspective. Um, so it sounds to me like you are very, um, uh, you have a lot of discretion about any time that you do uh, prescribe a mono product. And yet you say that right now, the current prior authorization process for that is you describe as an act of Congress 
to get this through. Could you describe a little bit more about um, why you described it that way? And what does that, what kind of impact does that amount of work have for a, a patient's treatment path? Well, if somebody, if I think somebody needs monoproduct and they don't actually have a flat out allergy, in other words, a rash, difficulty breathing, swollen face, the whole works, then they, it requires that we, uh, you know, first of all, document what the, what the side effects are. And then we have to document uh, what we've done to treat the side effect. So if someone has significant nausea, what did we do to treat the nausea? Uh, if they have a headache, what did we do to treat the headache? Um, if they do have other side effects, what did we do to treat the side effects? And you know, a lot of times the treatment of those side effects is really not all that effective. And I've had people want to abandon treatment if they can't have the monoproduct, if they can't, um, you know, if they can't take a medication without getting horrible side effects, they don't want to take it. And that of course makes sense. Um, so it is very difficult for us to, uh, you know, to get prior authorization for the monoproduct under any circumstances. Now that said, I don't believe that we should uh, completely abandon uh, prior authorization or some um, uh, breaks on the, on the prescription of monoproduct uh, for the reasons that I have stated. Um, Going back, however, I have to say that of all of the insurance companies that we have to deal with in the prior authorization, Vermont Medicaid has been the most cooperative and has done the most to streamline the prior authorization process for almost everything else um, of everything. I mean, I have very few pro problems with Vermont Medicaid. And if you'd like to hear from my nurse, uh, Mrs. Schaffner, who does all of my prior authorizations for me, I checked with her yesterday before I made this statement and she agreed that Vermont Medicaid is the easiest for the most part to get prior authorization from. It's the buprenorphine monoproduct that we have the most issue with. Um, Dr. Lord, we have an, um, another question from- Please. Uh, actually, Representative Whitman asked my question, so I Okay, think Representative McFawn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, doctor, uh, I want to switch uh, a little bit. Um, <clears throat> you, you mentioned that there were no waiting periods that you were really aware of, but also you mentioned um, that if somebody comes in today looking for help, you tell them, come on back tomorrow. We can see them within the, the 24 hours. Um, can you just talk about a little, we hear a lot about you need to strike when the iron's hot when somebody's looking for help? Um, well, I mean, there- <laughs> Help me understand what you mean. Well, you know, there are practical considerations. If somebody calls at four o'clock on a Monday afternoon, uh, y you know, uh, <laughs> I don't know a doctor's office in the world for anything, even for cancer, that you're gonna get an appointment the same day unless you're, uh, you know, unless it's a, a, a medical emergency. Uh, we do our level best to get people into the, you know, in here just as rapidly as we possibly can, uh, because we understand you're absolutely right. You strike when the iron is hot, when the patient's ready, the patient's ready, and we need to get them in. I agree completely. Um, there are, there are, there's a program. I mean, I noticed in the end of this bill that you talked about the emergency response to, to opioid um, uh, emergency response support. I think it's section 11. Um, there is a program that DB, uh, the DIVA has, has sponsored. It's called the Rapid Access to Medication Treatment uh, Program. Under this program, somebody can, who is ready for treatment and who is, you know, wants to get in right away can present to the emergency, for instance, in this area, a patient can present to the emergency room, either at Springfield or Mount Escutney Hospital, uh, be evaluated if appropriate, give, be given their first dose of buprenorphine that, at that time, and then People call, they, the ER calls my office and we will see the patient tomorrow. Um, if they call early enough in the day and there's time, we'll see them this afternoon. I mean, we do have, you, you know, com compared to a waiting list of, you know, three or four weeks or a month, which was true several years ago, I think we've come an awfully long way in making sure that people get into treatment just as fast as possible. Um, and I have to tell you something else too. There are a lot of people, uh, particularly at the methadone clinic, we get people who call in extremists 
And we say, fine, come in the next day and they don't show up. I can't tell you the number of times I have come in um, uh, expecting a full load of patients that day and wind up sitting around reading the newspaper or doing paperwork um, because people don't come. So, you know, it, this, there's, there's a balancing act here, um, but patients, you know, if patients want to get in, we get them in just as fast as we possibly can. We, we, and we don't sit around letting flowers grow under our feet, uh, representative, seriously. We do our level best to get people in just as fast as we can, as Thank practically you. possible. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, Dr. Lord, thank you so much for being here today. I kind of wish that we had heard from you first off. You have some great suggestions and thoughts and clearly amazing background. I, um, I'm wondering about what you, you talked about a little bit, which was the um, other barriers to this care, things like childcare issues and transportation issues. And you, you brought up a grant program, and I'm someone in this committee who works a lot on child care, and I'm kind of curious, was that around child care, or how, how, are you, how are you trying to help your patients with some of those things? We do have something around trans a little bit of transportation, I think, with a van in our bill, but I'm curious right. about the Well, yeah, I'm not sure about that van. Um, it's an interesting <laughs> concept. You know, the problem with the van is that I wonder how we're going to, you know, uh, how we're going to make the counseling component work or, you know, we're going to have, uh, you know, mobile counseling sessions. I mean, you know, medication alone is not going to treat this disease. It doesn't treat this disorder. You have to have a combination of, of, of that plus psychosocial interventions, um, you know, uh, so I, I'm not sure about the van. As far as transportation is concerned, I think that that is the number one barrier to the patients, both in my, um, uh, both in my uh, uh, OTP, uh, opioid treatment program, methadone clinic up in West Lebanon and here. Now, um, there is a, a program that uh, we had a, a program called Ride to Recovery that was supported by a grant through the Springfield Turning Point. Uh, which worked great until it ran out of money. There's another grant program, and I'm sorry that the name of it escapes me, but there is another program that is ramping up uh, that's, uh, I think, going through volunteers in action. And, you know, I can certainly learn more about that. We heard about that in our Windsor County Substance Use uh, uh, Disorder Collaborative last week, um, where, um, you know, transportation... Uh, is, is going to be addressed. We have a number of people in our practice who have volunteered uh, for various things, and some people would like to help with transportation. We're going to refer them on to them because this program is going to do background checks and vehicle checks and, you know, the kinds of things that, are, you know, safety would require. But yes, transportation is a huge issue, and Medicaid transportation is not always terribly reliable. It's better in Vermont than it is in New Hampshire, but it's still not always reliable. I mean, I have had patients left stranded because the Medicaid ride didn't show up, show back up to take them home. So that is an issue. Child care can be an issue. Um, you know, we, <laughs> we wind up having kids in our, in our waiting room. That's not terribly appropriate because it's hard to do therapy, hard to do counseling when you get, you know, you're worried about your kid running around. Um, so we, we've, we've tried to, uh, you know, we've tried to address that somewhat. We do participate in the Hub Spoke program. We are a single specialty uh, addiction program uh, here uh, at, at CVAR, and we have a spoke nurse. Um, uh, Ms. Jones is uh, 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 a certified case manager, and she works very hard to help address the transportation, child care, economic services issues, um, insurance, and that kind of thing that, um, uh, that, that people run into. Uh, we also, as a nonprofit entity, we also have a small fund to cover um, uh, shortfalls in insurance, such as co-pays and, uh, uh, and deductibles uh, for people um, uh, who just aren't able to afford those sorts of things. So we, we do have a small fund that helps cover that. And we have a sliding scale uh, for people who have no insurance um, so that 
you know, nobody is denied payment is denied treatment because of because um, uh, of an inability to pay. Um, we, we wrote off fifty three thousand dollars worth of free care last year. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much for all that you're doing out there. Thank you. Um, I'm Dr. Lord, I'm looking around the table and on the screen to see if there are any um, further questions. Um, although I think I speak for many of us, we could sit here and pepper you with questions for the next three hours. Um, and I'm free till I'm free till 10 <laughs> o'clock. So <laughs> bring it on. Um, Uh, have you um, have you shared your thoughts with, um, or is there anyone to share your thoughts with around the mono product um, to see if you can be a voice for helping to change that? Um, I mean, I, I guess I'm wondering if if you or your nurse have have um, commented. Um, or shared the feedback that you shared with us to um, the folks um, at Medicaid um, oh, about sure. having to move mountains for, for yes. that. Yes, we have. And as a matter of fact, I had a very long uh, 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 interaction with Mr. Falland. Uh, I don't know if you guys know Tony Falland. He's with, uh, with ADAP. Um, he's also the uh, State Opioid Treatment Authority for Vermont. Um, and, you know... Uh, and I've also spoken, you know, Dr. Luconis and I, we all talk, Dr. Luconis, Dr. Kloster, who I think you're going to hear from tomorrow, um, uh, Dr. Rappaport in Barrie, Dr. Brooklyn in Burlington. Um, we all talk. Uh, we, in fact, we meet every Friday. I, I don't go to those all the time because I have other commitments, but we meet uh, frequently and talk about this. And I think we are all uh, of a mind that, you know, it would be nice if the, if the, um, uh, if the prior authorization requirements were somewhat more relaxed, but I think we all agree that buprenorphine monoproduct is a, is a, can be a double-edged sword, and we all still believe that we should be careful with it. Um, it, it should not be, um, it, it shouldn't be treated lightly. Um, so for, the what do you mean? for the reasons that I've said. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lord. Um, since this is out of my wheelhouse, the concept of what you one has to go through for pre-authorization. When you say relaxed, what does that mean? What, would, what it what means would is if I mean? if I was to say if I was to call Vermont Medicaid or if I was to call whoever and say uh, this patient we have trialed or has trialed buprenorphine monoproduct, it, they have the following symptoms. In my professional opinion the patient should have Vermont should have buprenorphine monoproduct as a reasonable thing up to 16 milligrams. They should say, okay, that's fine. Okay. And instead what happens? Instead, I have to, I have to, as I, as I've said, I have to, uh, I have to demonstrate that, you know, I have tried to treat the nausea and the headaches and put the patient through you know, a difficult time dealing with side effects that are oftentimes inadequately treated. And a, as I said, you know, back when I, in, in the recent past, I was a, a you know, I, I practiced orthopedic oncology way, way back. And we prescribed adriamycin and methotrexate and all kinds of other terrible poisonous drugs. In those circumstances, it is entirely appropriate to treat side effects because the drug was necessary and there's no getting around it. In this circumstance, it's silly. And there's no other drug that I think that, that has been, that you do that with. I mean, if you take a cholesterol drug and it produces side effects, do they give you medication to, to treat the side effects? No, they put you on another drug, right? Uh, so, you know, uh, you know, I, again, cholesterol drugs don't get abused all that much. So, so it's a, a little bit different, but still the concept is the same. Uh, you know, if I think that somebody should get monoproduct because they have unacceptable side effects, I think my word ought to be good enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, this has been really very helpful. And uh, as others have stated, thank you for what you are doing um, in Vermont um, oh. and in New Hampshire, but we're more focused on Vermont. Um, well, so you know, I, I can throw a rock from my office and hit the Connecticut River. So it, it's kind of hard to avoid New Hampshire, you know. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for um, helping us as we figure out what our next steps are or what we might ask um, the Department of Health access to explore right. or something like that. So. Well, Ma Madam Chair, it is my great pleasure to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to talk with you this morning. And I mean this sincerely, if there is anything else that our practice can do to help or information that we can give or uh, you know, anything, please call on us. Julie knows how to get a hold of me. Um, and uh, you know, I answer my phone. So thank you, thank you, okay. um, uh, Doctor. Um, not only will we take you up on it, but as this bill proceeds through the process and goes to the Senate, we will highly recommend that the Senate Health and Welfare Committee connects with you as well. Uh, I believe Miss Clarkson is on that committee, is she not, or Miss Nitka, one of the um, two? She is not on health and welfare. She's on government operations and economic development. Okay. But if I can figure out a way how those committees could hear from you, maybe I can do that. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much, Doctor. My pleasure. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Um, and this ends um, our uh, morning session. Um, and um, if there is time, uh, based on what is floor action, 15 minutes when the floor is over, we will come up and have a further discuss committee discussion before taking up more testimony tomorrow morning.